Okay, we've been looking at situations in which we're trying to get the proportion of people who agreed with whatever question we're asking, whether we're asking them um, yes or no, whether they prefer Obama or Romney, or whether they like green M&Ms or some other color. Those are examples where we're looking at categorical data and we're going to get the percentage of people who agree with whatever statement that we have. Um, but however, the most common types of studies that are done are done where it is quantitative in nature, where you're going to take the mean of your data and try to show that your sample is the same as the population. So sample means is the most common statistics um, type of problem that you're going to look at in real life. So take a look at here. Here's a situation where we're trying to compare household earnings for samples of size 100. Household earnings meaning how much money they bring into the house. And we have two different size, uh, samples of size 100. And the first one shows um, a graph that is sharply skewed to the right, approximately normal. Um, because of the sharp the skewness, you notice that the mean is pulled to the right of the center. The center seems to be right around 40, and the mean maybe is around 70 or 80. So it's been pulled towards the tail. And no, no unusual features, but certainly the spread of this data seems to be from zero to about $250,000. Okay, now compare that with the graph on the left. This one um, has a center of about the same spot, around 80. However, this one has um, a much less range, so there's less variability, and it's um, definitely more normal shape than the first curve. No skewness in here at all. Okay, so this is two different types of graphs that you can get when you're looking at means. So the idea is just like with proportions, we have some, some sort of population with a known mean. We're going to take a bunch of random samples of each of the same size, and we're going to calculate the mean of each of those samples, and we're going to create a sampling distribution. Remember, this is a sampling distribution, meaning all possible samples. And um, it will be a normal curve, and you'll notice that the mean of x bar is exactly the mean of our population. And the standard deviation, as the form I've been giving, is sigma divided by the square root of n. So these are two formulas that we're going to use to estimate what the mean standard deviation is of our sample, knowing the mean and standard deviation of our um, population. Okay, so when you're sampling from a pop, uh, normal population, it's very important that you consider the shape of the distribution. The shape will do, um, um, affect how you make decisions. Um, a very simple relationship is the fact that if you're your population is approximately normal, then your sample will always be approximately normal. There's a direct connection. This is true no matter what the sample size is. If your population is normal, you can automatically assume your sample is normal. Um, and in that situation, if the population is normally distributed, the mean and standard deviation of the population are used to find the mean of your sampling distribution, which the mean and x bar will be uh, the same, and the standard deviation is gotten by this formula. So these are two formulas that you need to write down on your formula sheet, namely that the mean of x bars will always be the mean of your population, and that the standard deviation of your sample will be your standard deviation of your population divided by the square root of the sample size. That real quick. There we go. So mean of the of the x bars will be the mean of your population, and the standard deviation is your standard deviation of your population divided by the square root of sample size. So add this to the formula sheet or the note sheets for this these videos. So if you remember, we were looking at young women's height, where where the young woman had an um, average height of 64 and a half inches with a standard deviation of two and a half inches. So let's find the probability that a randomly selected young woman is taller than 66 and a half inches. Well, if you notice, our sampling distribution, which is the one in blue or green, is a little different in terms of the, what the whole population looks like. The whole population is approximately normal, but it has a greater variation. The sample will also be approximately normal, but if you notice, much less variation, and that's because our sample size um, means that we're not um, obviously not doing a census, but not doing everybody. So the um, smaller the sample size, uh, the greater the sample size actually, the smaller the variation. And so you can see here that um, your sample will be have a much narrow range than what the um, original popu uh, original population would have. 
So what happens if the population is not normal? If it's normal, we can assume our samples will be normal. But what if the original population is not normal? What would be the shape of our sample? Well, as it turns out that, uh, and this will be an activity we do in class, that no matter what the, sh the population shape stands, uh, starts out with, if you have a big enough sample size, your sample will become approximately normal. And this is what is known as essential limit theorem. And you need to copy this formula down on your notes here. And basically says that if you draw a simple random sample of any size from a population with a mean and finite standard deviation, the essential limit theorem says that assuming n is large, the sampling distribution of the mean sample will become approximately normal. And this will be uh, actually a pretty astounding fact if we look, look at the activity that we'll be doing in class involving uh, um, pennies. Um, what the magic number is um, does vary, but for our class, in order for uh, a sample to be considered normal, when it's quantitative, we're going to use the number 30. When n is greater than or equal to 30, we can assume that the sample is approximately normal. If it's less than 30, we actually have to check to see if it's normal. If it's bigger than 30, we can automatically assume it's normal and go on with our calculations. So here's the situation. This is an applet that we'll take a look at in class. Here's our population. A very, very strange population. This is actually be something that has trimodal. It has three different modes. And if you look here, we're going to take samples of larger and larger size. So this is a samples of two. And you can see, wow, i got a really interesting pattern, somewhat related to the population, but certainly different. But when you get to size 5, you can see, wow, the data is becoming normal, approximately normal, certainly more than with the original one. And by the time you get to sizes 10 and 25, we got data that looks almost normal. So even though we started out with a population that was really, really not normal, our sample, by the time it got to size 25, was pretty close to being normal. And so um, and for our situations, again, whenever we have a sample size greater than or equal to 30, we can assume that our sample will be normal. If it's less than 30, we're going to have to check to see if the sample is normal. If you notice here, if I did sample size 2, the data would not be normal. But by the time you get to sizes 5 and 10, you can see that the data becomes approximately normal. So the bigger the sample size, the more normal our sample will become. So here's an example problem showing how to, to solve a problem of this nature from beginning to end. This is a situation um, involving um, a company who services air, air conditioners trying to keep track of how long it takes their um, technicians to complete an, an average um, service call. And so this is a quantitative in nature because it's measuring time. And it certainly makes sense to talk about one and a half hours or six and a half minutes, etc. So um, taking averages makes sense. So if you notice here, the mean time, this is the population. The mean time is one hour and the standard deviation happens to also to be one. And so the question comes up here is, um, does your company... If you take a, a simple random sample of 70 air conditioners... Um, and we've budgeted 1.1 hours per unit, a little bit higher than what the mean is. Will this be enough? Okay, so this is, remember the four steps to solving a problem. State, plan, do, and conclude. You need to copy these four steps down onto the, the same example on your worksheet. And we've stated the problem. We're trying to figure out if we use 1.1 hours, is that enough time to uh, uh, budget, to, enough time to budget um, all of those um, service calls that our company is doing. So plan is, this is where the rule of 10 comes in. We've got to make sure that the 10% condition is met. And so if you notice here, our sample is 70. If I multiply that by 10, um, that means there needs to be at least 70 air, air, 700 air conditioners in the population. And in any large city, you're guaranteed to have 700 people who have air conditioners that need services. So that's a pretty safe assumption to say that our population is bigger than 700. Because of that, we know that the standard deviation of our samples will be approximately the same. And therefore, we can use the formula S equals sigma over the square root of n, which in this case, remember the standard deviation of our population is 1 over the square root of our sample size is 1 over the square root of 70. Which, if you grab your calculator, comes out to approximately 0 0.12. So this is their standard deviation of our sample. Now remember that the mean of our sample will be exactly the same as the mean 
of our population. So in this case, if you remember, the mean was 1, and so because the mean of our population is 1, that means the mean of our sample will also be 1. And so I use the uh, um, fact that the standard deviation is about 0.12. Okay, so since the mean is 1 and the standard deviation is 0.12, as you can see here, I have a bell curve drawn, and I can actually answer the question now about, um, the question is if I budget 1.1 hours, if that's enough, enough time. So if you notice, I use the z-score here, 1.1 uh, minus the mean, 1, divided by the standard deviation of my sample, 0.12, and I use the book, uh, table A in the book, and it comes out 0.83. But remember, this is shaded to the right, so remember, I've got to subtract that from 1 to find out what the percentage is, and it becomes 0 0.203. Also, you remember, you can use normal CDF um, feature on your calculator where you type in your starting point, which is 1.1 to infinity, where your mean is 1 and your standard deviation is 0.12, and it will give you the same percentage, 20.33%. So now we've got to do the conclude. So we budget 1.1 hours. There's a 20% chance that the technicians will not be able to complete the work within budget time. 20% of the time, they're indeed going to need more time. 80% of the time, no problem. So you notice there's the four conditions. State, plan, do, and conclude um, in their entirety. Make sure you copy this down in your notes. See you in class next week.